Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Today we're going to be looking at 1981's Comic Scene Magazine, issue number one, taking fandom and making comic books mainstream. Cartoonist Kayfabe is a daily comic book YouTube channel. We have over 1,500 videos in our archives, and you can search those on the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube homepage. Go under the search bar, enter your favorite title or favorite creator. We may have a video waiting for you. We are partially brought to you by the Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon. We have three different levels that will give you access to our videos early, and at the King Kayfaber level, you will be the first one in line to see all of our videos because you sit in on the recording session. This will give you first crack at whatever books we're talking about and showing off before they disappear or go up in price. So check out our Patreon, see which level suits you best. And finally, our next public appearance will be December 16th in New York City at Big Apple Con. Come on out. It's been a while since uh, we've done a show in New York. So sure. come on out. Bring some of our books for us to sign and uh, say hello in person. Yeah, looking forward to that show. And looking forward to talking about comic scene issue number one, Jimmy. Pretty cool to uh, to be looking at this book, Ed, because when I start getting into comics in the late 80s, early 90s, this is what I would find, or yeah. comic scene magazines. Occasionally, I'd get them at the newsstand where I was buying my comic books from, but I would just scoop up anything I could, and comic scene was pretty good. It would have, like, advanced art, so you might see some penciled pages. Uh, it covered a wide variety of stuff. Indies, stuff outside Marvel DC. It was always something I had never heard of. Comics history with strip artists. So it's just a, uh, a very good sample, and it was kind of cool... So this is 1981, their premiere issue. It's coming out from the people that are do like Starlog. Yeah. So I'm going to say nerd culture, mm -hmm. you know, geek culture. And they basically were looking around and from word in their office and word on the street, it's like comics have a popularity to them, but they don't have a mainstream representation. We think we can do one. Yeah, it's true. Like, like uh, so many thoughts in mind when we are going through this thing, man, because uh, it's they say up front in the editorial. And, and I would see this on the set. I never picked one of these up because uh, if I would glance at it, at the Walden Books, at the mall, that's where I would see it. At least at that time, probably post-89... It's got it's got photo covers of like whatever the movie du jour, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, that kind of stuff, and it's much more steeped in that kind of thing. And it gave me nothing but superficial, uh, which is interesting because like you, that's your the first time you saw Crow, and there's like the image one and stuff. First time I saw Weapon X, Barry Windsor Smith. Yeah, like I was shitting on it at that point because I'm just like, oh, it's it's not it's not deep enough. But the things that the things that I was thinking about is really in relation to our YouTube and shit because this is like. There are several other kind of comic comic channels that have like immense popularity, and uh, there's a newer dude. I don't I don't even remember his name, but he has like nine videos, and some of them have like over a million. And uh, that's like reportage. Like he cannot do what you or I do. He has no skin in the game. He is going through Wikipedia's and like reading articles and kind of giving you overviews, and like that's what comic scene is in a way. Now this is a very good treatment. And I, I can't wait to go through this with you. But it acknowledges stuff like Comics Journal that is much deeper. And there's even an ad for a Comics Journal in here. So uh, this is the mall version of Comic Magazine. Just like some of those YouTube channels are like the broad for everybody kind of thing. And that's going to yield the bigger audience. Because most people don't give a fuck about the rendering on an ankle muscle that we'll be talking about and stuff like that. So it's 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 something to keep in mind for our own purposes. Like maybe we do some reportage here and there. I'm very curious about this magazine in general because when I'm reading it, like it goes into image coverage. Like it's around for at least a dozen years. Yeah, yeah. They're, so well, it's well, successful in 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 regards to being able to run a glossy full color magazine. This volume one is like six issues or yeah. something, and then it goes away for years. It doesn't go away too long. Yeah, it, it goes away for a little while, and, th and then it comes back. But then it becomes, you know, it's the, it's the Hollywood stuff that becomes the big deal. Hollywood stuff's in this first issue. It's always been a almost like their strategy for anybody talking comics. Right. I like this design, the Saurian mask. Yeah, is that from Enemy Mine? Was Enemy no Mine idea. out in 81? You know that one? Uh, yeah, I, I do. Dennis, uh, Randy Quaid? Gossett Jr.? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's right. I forgot <laughs> about that. <laughs> I never saw that movie, so I'm not sure, but the characters so did look many a little times, like that. Man, that shit was on, like, HBO in the 80s would play the same movie fucking five times a day. 
So one thing to keep in mind at home, this is January 81. This is the beginning of the 80s, like like right in the beginning. And uh, that means very early comic book stores and very early direct market, which is talked about here almost sideways by like the Marvel, you know, by some of the veterans. It's almost like they're not sure what to make of it yet. Yeah. And uh, it's almost viewed suspiciously. So Carrie O'Quinn is the publisher, not always going to be delivering this intro, but just setting it up the series or, you know, launching this new magazine. Why did we do this? And uh publisher weighs in on that. And what I take from this is comics up to this point had been represented by fans. Right. We're going to go mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, he acknowledges we're not going to make your fanzines go away. We're, we're going to try something a little differently. I think this is a very good magazine. We, you know, with all the stuff I say about the reportage and stuff, I, I think it's very well represented. And this this first issue, it does feel like you're throwing a lot of stuff at the wall and, and, and seeing, seeing what's going to connect. But I think it does it seamlessly. There's a real vision represented by this editorial. We I, I look at a bunch of these first issues, like um, Amazing Heroes is one that we talked about, uh, which is kind of the comics journal superhero yeah. genre magazine. And... The first issue is very different than what that magazine shapes into. I feel like this first issue, pretty indicative of what comic scene is. Yeah. And I think that that's outlined very clearly here. Like this is a, they identify as professional comics magazine. And I think that that's on display throughout, you know, and by that, I mean, they figured out what the magazine was going to be before they released issue one. So issue one is a part of that. Open up with our kind of a news item, you know, what kind of stuff is coming up. Here's some stuff to look out for if you're a comics fan. Top piece is premiere of Destroyer Duck, right. which uh, goes very well with the Howard the Duck movie adaptation as your B story. Right. This piece is sculpted by Stan Winston, and uh, he really comes into his own when he's doing like Predator and some of his other designs like m much later. I, I didn't know that he was was doing work on stuff like like Howard the Duck. And this is still very old. Like I think the Howard the Duck movie is closer to 86. 84 maybe? Yeah. I, yeah some some years year, away. But yeah, it is it is some time some time out, which is pretty interesting to consider because like they talk about it like well, we don't want the legal issues to, you know, create a problem here. I wonder if they did, if that was right. part of the delay issues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a very expensive enterprise. 1982 plans for new titles debut including GI Joe. And what's fascinating and interesting about this when you dig into the history is that GI Joe was such a tough sale to uh retailers that I think if you believe the kayfabe, Jim Shooter offer, offered it returnable to people as like a special thing even through the the direct market. Uh so many stores did not uh, participate and it created a situation of underordered number twos uh, that issue number one I think it went into reprints and I think it's like one of the early like Marvel type comics to, to go into reprints and the issue two because of the scarcity it, it was worth more than issue one for a long time there but I wonder that doesn't happen more frequently if you look at the numbers and the scarcities and stuff like the number ones are always the most plentiful, and it always gets the biggest. That's what I'm reward. saying. It's really stupid. Yeah, it's it's an inverse of traditional supply and demand. It's exactly. manipulation of the market. Like 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 with the red room stuff, for instance, the sketch cover variant for for issue one is a second printing. There's like four thousand of them. Their other uh, launch is Team America. Doesn't do quite as good as GI Joe. The the, uh, the motorcycle uh, issue. So other Marvel uh, plans or debuts, they're playing with format. That includes a Wolverine miniseries, Vision, and the Scarlet Witch miniseries. Um, so you're seeing Hercules, you know, like this is, this is, they're starting to bring in these other formats. Yes, and, and that's super noteworthy. So like they're lining up the Wolverine to be like their first miniseries, they're saying. And it said maybe Frank Miller, probably Frank Miller's going to be the guy to do it. So that's, that's, that's totally noteworthy. Yeah, and you know what? It makes me wonder, like, this issue is January 81. They're talking about 1982 plans. Like, are they really talking a year out? It feels like something's wrong with the dates on, on yeah, this it must, stuff. Yeah, it, it must be January 82. But look on the cover, like the front cover. Well, they have it in here as... Oh, I saw it in here somewhere. Well, January up here, and then 19 copyright 1981. But it yeah. doesn't make sense. Like, it would need to be... I just don't think you're pushing a year out. Yeah. But then some of their creative teams are wrong. So it makes me wonder, like, 
Right. Maybe it's not as professional yet. You know, there's some kinks there still. Uh, but it's interesting to me to see like what they're actually publishing at this time. Star Trek. I didn't realize they were publishing Star Trek, but sales are not good. Right. It's going away with like issue 15 or something. Like it's, it's, they gave it a year and a half or something and it's, and it's going nowhere. I have a couple of those and they are boring. Like, they, like Star Trek is pretty whack compared to Star Wars. I'm going to guess that this is, this is January 82 and that this thing came out like magazines do in late 81. Mm -hmm. um, Blade Runner and Annie, there's a lot of licensing that goes on underneath Jim Shooter. So you get some of that. So, so any the, it, like, the movie adaptation. Okay, that that's going to be important for when we get to the Swamp Thing piece. The videos are brought to you by the books that we make, and 2023 was and is a big year. 2024 is going to be just the same. The Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is out there. About 75% of this print run has uh, been accounted for, so you guys have about 25% left of our, our stock to go. Scoop up that book if you see it. It's going to make an excellent gift. The X-Men Grand Design Trilogy comes out uh, November 14th. It collects all of my X-Men Grand Design works inside of one nice, handy, uh, soft cover. Scoop that up. There are three volumes of Red Room that are uh, completed. Two of them are out on the stands right now, the Antisocial Network and Trigger Warnings. But coming to you in early 2024 is Red Room Crypto Killers with dozens of pages of extra features and commentary in the back. Street Angel, Princess of Poverty is coming to you at the end of November. Uh, it is a companion piece to Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. Uh, you get both of these books. You have all of Jimmy's uh, Street Angel comics to date. He's been self-publishing, and here you have True Crime Funnies, the black and white zine, 1986 zine. Go to Jimmy's website. Uh, he might be sold out right at the moment, but uh, you never know. He, he might have fresh stock, depending on when you're watching this video. And uh, Hulk Grand Design is Jimmy's contribution to the Grand Design mythology that we have created for Marvel Comics. Now that we're done paying the bills, let's get back to the video. All right, so of course you have to do DC News, and they're changing around their editorial. Um, Giordano becomes this managing editor person who I kind of think of as the guy I've under underrated his influence on comics, but it seems like he's the guy who's dealing with all kinds of talent and bringing them in and, and really kind of pushing DC. Right. Neil Adams, Miss Mystic uh, with Pacific Comics. Uh, they talk about its origins and there was actually a lawsuit uh, where Miss Mystic is concerned because that dude, Michael Netzer was a part, he's a part of continuity and he says he, he created Miss Mystic as a crusty bunker Neil Adams kind of took it and it was established in those early portfolios and stuff. So like that, that was an actual lawsuit that had to, had to be settled and things. We talked about that, the, the, the Muppets uh, comic strip and how newspapers were bidding on it. And they, the syndicate was even doing work to figure out the creative team. And I think Bandis looks good. That looks really good, dude. Say Walt Kelly's a big influence on them and you could see it there with the lettering and just the the pagination, the way the panel borders are like, I would love a collection of that. I would love to read that. That looks special. Yeah. I'd be very curious about that. When did we, what did we cover that for? I remember us talking about it, but do you remember what the context was? Yeah. It could have, it could have been like an amazing heroes or, or it was a magazine that we, that we were looking at. We got to that. Uh, it might've been a later comic scene that we, that we looked at or something because, because I was shitting on it. I was like, I never heard of that. Like I never seen that. And in the article, they were talking about how there was bidding wars for that strip. Yeah. Alvin and the Chipmunks. This is this is what you get, though, with comic scene is this cross-section where an Alvin and the Chipmunks can be next to a Dick Giordano being it's uh, all managing for editor. Piece of... Go ahead. An overview of the undergrounds. Uh, this is kind of fun, too, because you see, like, they reference undergrounds on page six. It's actually page ten. So, again, new magazine working out some kinks. But just kind of running down, uh, like they do, like, here's Marvel News, here's DC News. Now you're going to get rip-off press less gasp kitchen sink some of the uh the indie slash underground publishers and what they're up to and what was cool is like all the all the key names are are still mentioned you know like like the those publishers are still doing stuff with the, the key guys yeah it's pretty good to have this magazine where you go from alvin and the chipmunks to robert williams and s clay wilson working on cocaine comics <laughs> <laughs> star reach is is uh is is referenced so pretty interesting, like what's happening, you know, Bizarre Sex, which is the first appearance of Omaha. They misspell it as Omala, the uh, the funny animal character, Jay Lynch. So you have these underground 
names that we know from different places yeah, all Gilbert, still being represented here. Gilbert Shelton has Clay Wilson up there. And and this is key. This is an important thing, man. I remember grabbing my first wizard and seeing Dave Cockrum's name and like it, it's installing these names into your mind so that like as you go out and dig for comics, like now you're now you're drawing those con connections. It's like Seth told us on a shoot interview where like a big part of your early collecting is to just figure out the medium uh, that that you have some passion for. Yeah, absolutely. Last Gasp is reprinting classic Zap Zero and Zap Number One. Pretty fun to think of like all this is happening at once. And because of the direct market, you kind of now may have access to all of this stuff. Yeah. So Marvel turns 20. This is their big feature here on issue one is this overview of Marvel. And it has Jim Galton, who is the president of Marvel, Stan Lee, who is titled publisher at this point, and uh, editor-in-chief Jim Shooter. There's also Jack Kirby artist is mentioned here, but somewhat at odds with the rest of the uh, tone of this this article. Absolutely. This is the article that we were talking about where, where Jim Galton, Jim Shooter, and Stan Lee are letting all of you guys know that, yes, these comics are made for 11-year-olds. Yeah, they do say that very clearly. This is your history of Marvel. So pre-Marvel Universe, they give a little bit of background. And then they get into the uh, the '60s, and of course, creating the Marvel Universe and flawed heroes, and how that all goes. Yeah, and this, and you know, the, the, once again, this is the reportage stuff, like those super super popular like YouTube channels. Like they do the video version of that, where it's just like the very bare bones, catching you up to speed type stuff. Stan Stan the Man today, he says four thousand times that he doesn't even look at the comics anymore. It's very interesting because none of these three read the comics before they're published. Shooter, Shooter says he reads them all once they're published and uh, lets his editors, like one of his big implements for this, because Marvel had been going through editors in chief like very quickly. Yeah. He gets group editors and it's basically there's so much stuff happening at Marvel, it's impossible for an editor in chief to do it all. Yeah. So you have these editors underneath you and uh, kind of interesting to think like, he lets them do their thing. So if they do something wrong, it's going to happen after the book is out. Then we're going to have our talk. The way the way it's couched in this article is that he sees the flaws and he just go, oh, yeah, go ahead, go off the print, and then and then waits for it to come in so that he can now school you. That sounds that like is fun. how it's how it's couched. But you know what? It also protects him because imagine he's wrong, like the classic Stanley story <laughs> of Spider Man and Amazing Fantasy. Jim Shooter's not ever going to be the guy that said no. Don't publish this character. <laughs> Uh, this is the Kirby piece, which is, he thinks if you create these things that go on to be licensed and make all this money, you should get part of that as the artist. And so like early eighties and we're, we're getting the Kirby Marvel stuff is flaring up here. Yeah. It's, it's wild stuff. Cause like, you know, he's on, he's on the other end. Right. And he, and he did not envision under Ruse and all this stuff and all this Stan Lee presents bullshit. Uh, and he, he and he talks very very scathingly about the creatives. Even he's like, you know, nobody's inventing anything. It's all it's all just uh, selling old rope. Nobody's coming. Nobody has a point of view. Nobody has anything to say. Yeah, there's no advantage for them to produce the the creators today. If comics are not allowed to grow and you discourage people from creating, you're going to get a static product. That's really interesting. That if you discourage people, because I do think that the business practices are you're discouraged. Yeah, there's, yeah, no, there's no reason for you to create a new character and go to one of these companies that won't owe you anything, not even creative control, like nothing. Right. There's no incentive, so it is discouraging you from being creative. Yeah, we looked at uh, that Cosmic Odyssey book, and uh, that's Magnolia and uh, Jim Starlin. These guys, you know, they know what happened to Kirby, and there has to be an introduction of this like. Galactus-like villain who's going to destroy the four worlds and everything. What does Mike Mignola come up with? Like, a shape. Because why the fuck would he give DC Comics something that they can make toys of and he doesn't prosper from whatsoever? Now, there is the Stan Lee fucking company man part. This is the part that makes Stan Lee so unlikable because he's such like a company horror uh, that like, he'll say stuff like, uh, you know, we know... We knew what we were signing. We knew what the practices were of of the day, and I knew that uh, no matter what I was creating, it was the property of the publisher. So, it's about honesty. And these creators are being dishonest when uh, you know they sign sign their, their rights away, and then years later start crying about not having their rights. They knew what they were getting into. I knew what I was getting into, and the golden parachutes that he's been afforded his whole life. To go read that Marvel Untold Stories book. Uh, by Sh by Sean Howe. There's a there's a part in there with during like the Jimmy Palmiotti, fucking uh, Joe Quesada era, where whoever owns it at that time is like, who's this guy that we're Stan Lee guy that we're paying 1.5 million dollars to a year? Like, 
let's clear the books for, with this guy. Stan Lee comes in there, and by the time he leaves the conversation, his, his, uh, his yearly wage is doubled, and he gets money for his wife as like some kind of consulta- some consultant work or something like that. Like The charm that he brings to the game... Uh, he doesn't have to cry about uh, the ownership when when Jack Kirby, you know, he has to ro- work at Ruby Spears and he has to do all this kinds of stuff to make ends meet because the 10,000 pages that he drew for Marvel, it's not bringing in no dough. This is a pretty amazing article in a lot of ways because like today's problems and it's exactly what you said. Like this is if you guys want to read exactly Stanley's quote, here it is, pause it at home and read it. Uh, but they're talking about the creator, you know, problems with these creators. They even cite like the uh, 78 copyright law changes, which is why I think Kirby has more of a uh, a stake in this than people who have come in after that, uh, because it's pretty clear after that. But beforehand, there's there's definitely some wiggle room. But then it gets into like Shooter and the fan press and how like he's just vilified in the yeah. fan press. And then we go to approaches to comics and they talk about the people who have left Marvel. Len Wein, uh, Marv Wolfman, Jerry Conway, Gene Colan, and uh, even Stan Lee is quoted in here like being surprised by Gene Colan leaving. And I think Colan reached out to Stan Lee like, what the hell's going on? And, you know, it's, it's this is like, there's some roasting going on here of our subjects. Totally. And, and like, like Shooter talks about like, yeah, man, like a lot of people talk shit on the, in the fanzines. None of you guys come up to me at conventions talking that smack. So, <laughs> so that's funny. And then Gene Colan is a famous one because, like, uh, especially when Shooter tells the story, he says that Gene Colan, like, literally went to Jim Galton and was like, this Jim Shooter is giving me so much trouble. I worked here for years before him, blah, blah, blah. Jim Galton goes right to Jim Shooter and is like, who's this fucking Gene Colan douchebag calling me? Like, what is? what am I paying you for, Shooter? How is this guy... How does he have my number? Go handle that. And uh, Shooter says the H word and shit, man, on, on all his interviews. He's like, Gene Colan was hacking. Gene Colan was being a hack and I called him on it. Wow. Yeah. Colan is, is like I said, Stan Lee weighs in on it. That, that was a big one. But then when you, uh, like comic artist magazine and stuff, when Gene Colan's doing his interviews and stuff, like he'll say that, you know, he'll get the criticism from Jim Shooter. He'll go home and do none of the changes and turn it in, and Jim Shooter's be like, yeah, you see how, how much better it is, and stuff like that? So, like, everybody's a maniac yeah. right there. Like, like Gene Colan had to go fucking draw some Batman comics. This is Stan Lee calling out John Byrne's work as somebody who he thinks is really good, yeah. and they're getting ready to do that uh, Silver Surfer one-shot, and we covered that on a previous video. It's it's going to be issue two of Comic Scene with the cog in the wheel quote, which we, we have a video about that, where it's about um, John Byrne's depositions during the, like, Howard the Duck, yes, uh, Jack Kirby stuff. This is where uh, Galton says the average age of Marvel readers is 11 and a half. So keep that in mind, you guys, as we look at some older comics, and, and maybe we point out that they look like they're written for uh, somebody younger. We've got some criticisms, man. What are you talking about, man? Uh, uh, the Adam Warlock saga, blah, blah, blah. Get the fuck out of here. They go through some of their some of their uh, numbers and things like that. I think their top-selling books, maybe like 400,000, is, is about their top. That's a surprise. But, but I, I'm too high or too, surprised by the too low. Uh, and, and my hope is that, that that's what sells and not the print run, uh, at this time. Like, like I would imagine like a 800,000 print run for 400,000 sales because, uh, because there are some hype books that like X-Men, right? Like that, that thing would, would hit, you know, 700 K later. This is Galton who's saying this and he says that Marvel cumulatively, cumulatively sells 5 million copies comics a month no title doing better than approximately four hundred thousand. so it is sales is what he's saying so yeah you know, okay so if you're selling so four hundred thousand, you're probably printing seven hundred and fifty thousand. yeah all right black and white dilemma this is where they go through like trying to do comics for older readers they don't sell and that's what this is the whole way down and i think they're planning on on pretty much canceling that whole line if they haven't already canceled it and and uh as as evidence of some of the stuff we checked out on the channel like they don't have the facility uh, I wonder if it's some chilling effect stuff, even even with that material. But when you read the um, Creepy and Eeries, they're kind of shit also. Like, you would get a thrill kill once every hundred fucking Warren stories. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there's not 
much to hold on to there. Look, man, I'd say the same thing about most DC comics. There are some exceptions. I think some of the Kurtzman War stories have some meat in the story. I'm just talking story. Yeah, yeah, But, I yeah. mean, like, they're rehash plots, and, and, you know, they're there for the O. Henry ending. They're there for great but, artists. Yeah, and... And, and I think and, Warren and has the, some of and that. And they're allowed to shine. Like, uh, the Richard Corbin doing the Devil's Pinball Machine is so fucking corny compared to, you know, Joe Orlando putting a little fucking whiskey tap on a, <laughs> on a dude's jugular vein because they're a bunch of vampires. Like, that shit is fucking cool as hell. I would defend EC Comics to my grave compared to any of this other bullshit. I'm just talking Warren. story. I'm not talking about Orlando being really smart in the artwork. Yeah. I don't argue with that at all. Yeah, I hear you. Um, media tie-ins. So this is Marvel doing licensed stuff, talking about really Star Wars, I think, is what really got them gung-ho on the licensing. They say that uh, Star Wars saved Marvel Comics in the late mid 70s and gi joe saved them through the 80s interesting before before x-men really hit and and they i think they say that the, that the hype comic like the four hundred thousand seller is is spider-man yeah i don't think they say it it may be spider-man but i don't oh yeah here we go yep leading seller spider-man and it sells less than uh less than half a million copies a month that's interesting because they they cite that half a million as like I guess Superman sells, which at their peak were selling 2 million copies a month. And now that's way down. Yeah. And Spider-Man even below that. And this would have been a time, I don't know that Spider-Man was doing too well in the early 80s. Right. For, to that, for Spider-Man to be their top seller, it probably is painting a grim picture. But, you know, there's a lot of that. Like, a lot of this article is about trying to clean up problems that Marvel has had and has had for a long time. And it's something that Jim Shooter really did. Like, the, you can, there, there is no kayfabe t- to that. He got he's 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 Mussolini. He got the trains to run on. Time. That's right. That's really that. That's a big chunk of it. Uh, direct market. So they start talking about that. They've got like three series that are going through the direct market, and it's very. I'm telling you, you read this, and it feels like we're just not sure what the direct market is yet. Uh-huh. We're experimenting a little bit, but we're not banking on it. Yeah, because they're not. They're also ran titles. You know, it's Marvel fanfare, so it's like an opportunity to use inventory strips, uh, and and it's Moon Knight, which is like an experimental piece. And I forget what the other K's are, maybe? Yeah, maybe. It feels like... I see and Micronauts mentioned. That feels like a bad idea, because that's a toy license. So, like, why would you not have the toy license comic in a place where you could get the toys? You know what? It must have been bad, because it says they're taking three soft titles, and they and they include it. So, at that point, maybe Micronauts was on its way out. The, like, correct... Like, you never saw a Micronauts toy, like, never. in a Kmart, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's before our times, man. Um, experiments, and this is getting into some of the miniseries, you know, playing with formats. I think they might even start talking a little bit about albums, you know, doing like an album series. One here they mention is X-Men by Claremont and Neil Adams. What happened to that one? Right. You know, that, that seems like one that you should go for. But then they also mentioned Death of Captain Marvel, which we know went on to be very celebrated. We have a video on it. And it is the first of the Marvel quote unquote graphic novels. So, um... I like seeing that. I like seeing like Marvel starting to push in this different direction and see what they could do. Same thing, future formats. Um, talking at this point with paperback, and they did a lot of those. Those cut up the comic page right. to make it fit the paperback, or just reduce them to very tiny. You know, if if you guys at home have not seen those, there are a lot of examples. You can probably find them cheap and do a flip through, and it's it's kind of interesting to see that stuff. And then licensing, right? Animating Marvel, so. Got to try to start exploiting these characters to their fullest, and, and that, that's that's where Galton is in here talking, and that's and that's where Stan Lee is, at, you know, publisher of Marvel Comics, who doesn't look at any of the comics, is is trying to woo Hollywood and, and make that stuff happen, and and one of the things that he does is like fuck up the rights yeah. for for decades by making terrible shit deals, so like Stan Lee can't even get that right. Subscription page. Never know how those are going to shake out. And now look, our second feature in issue number one of Comic Scene, got to do movie stuff. We've got to right. do movies. Right. It, it, it shocks me, like, when we go back through these old magazines, how much movies, even the first Comics Journal had a bunch of movie coverage. Right. It's such an integral part of, like, the idea of mainstreaming comic books. Yeah, because, I mean, like, look, look at what we're looking at, man. We're looking at nerd shit here, man. Conan, uh, Lone Ranger, and Tonto. Tarzan. Swamp Thing. By the way, I was down with all this stuff. I remember there was like a Lord Greystoke TV show when we were kids and shit. I was super into that. Uh, that dude, Michael Uslin, is is mentioned with the with the Swamp Thing and the success of Swamp Thing. And it's before it's before the Alan Moore Swamp Thing. And and he got the rights. Uh he is he is nobody. He was like a lawyer or something, just just like a regular dude. 
and he got the rights to um, Swamp Thing, but he also got the rights to uh, Batman in like 78, 79, uh, because there was no, there was no thought of like making movies of that stuff. The uh, the superheroes were totally shit up, shit upon. The Batman was was dead in the water with, with that pop culture, like you know the like the Biff Bam Pow right. type Batman stuff. So like in our shoot interview with Steve Bissett, we talked about how he and Total Bin got the worst rates at DC Comics, the lowest rates to do Swamp Thing, um, because. Uslan, when he got the rights to Swamp Thing, because he was like a, a mark for Bernie Rice and shit, he got all rights except for publishing. So, so the money that DC made on Swamp Thing was only for the comic books. They couldn't make a poster because Michael Uslan would get the with the rights on that. So for ten G's, Uslan gets the Batman rights because they didn't like think that anything would happen with it. And what he's even talking about in here, he had to be the happiest guy whenever Frank Miller comes around. Because what he's talking about here is really, you know, and this is three years after he got the initial rights. He's talking about like trying to do a more serious uh, version of, of Batman. And the only thing that he has to reference is the Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill shits. So they talk about that in here. Now, when he's pushing throughout these 80s, because like they're talking about, oh, yeah, it's about it's we're going to start filming soon, blah, blah, blah. That Annie movie that we mentioned earlier, that shit the bed. And so, like, these movie producers all put all of that stuff. Flash Gordon, Annie, hey, it's from the funny pages, like, and it's not hitting. So fuck your Batman movie or whatever. Right. Whenever Frank Miller comes out, dude, he had to be fucking jerking. Oh, yeah. Because he was paying religiously, you know, that 10 Gs a year or whatever for a decade. That's amazing. And, Greatest investment ever. And uh, his name is still on stuff. It's, it's on the cartoons. On every documentary, he's there. So, like, that dude, hand over fist, man. And, but he believed in it, and, and he 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 was in debt for, I mean, making no money on it. Just paying out, yeah. paying out. But he knew that holding on to that, like, holding on to his fucking balls, was going to pay off at some point. And his impetus was, was to do a serious Batman. You know what? Good on him for not getting rid of it. Because, like, it has it outlined here that, Polygram expects to release Batman through Warner Brothers in the fall of 82. So whenever that date comes and goes and like now superheroes have tanked or whatever, dude kept hold of it. Yeah, for, it took a decade. He got it like 78, 79 and, and then the movie comes mm -hmm. out, you know, in, in 89 or whatever. Check out this ad. Connecticut comic book stores. These are not like a, uh, a chain of one store. These are all the, a, a bunch of Connecticut stores let's get together and take out an ad i love it man very expensive like this is a newsstand magazine man and and uh this this could be five thousand dollars of 1980s money it could be and you might have you might have got your distributor paying a little bit of that too because all stores serviced by camara publishing distributing inc i never so heard of that. i haven't either but i just love the idea of like this message is brought to you by connecticut comic shops yeah it's, it's outside the box thinking you know Especially a bunch of probably some competition there. You sure. know, I bet some of the stores did not like each other. So more power to them. Uh, article on fandom. You know, we see in the editorial that we're going from fandom to professional. But you still got to kiss the ring. And this kind of outlines the history of comics fandom being part of like sci-fi conventions and things. You know, you see names like Outer Limits, Prisoner, Lost in Space, Star Trek, but then also becoming their own thing as this uh, photograph's a really good example of it. Absolutely. Uh, it does have the Hollywood, Hollywood connection that's kind of always been there. Um, so when we talk about that, how crazy San Diego Comic-Con has gotten, that is true. But uh, Hollywood was always a part of it. And uh, a lot of those guys, they, they say that Star Wars would not... They had this concentrated group of people that were able to um, spread the word. So things like even the Star Trek movies would never have been a twinkle in anybody's eye if it wasn't for the intense concentration of fandom who got together and organized Kind of interesting to see these like early conventions being mentioned too. San Diego, Creation Con, World Con. Mm -hmm. I love this stuff. I've, I've become more and more of a fan of this kind of like history of fandom and uh, the evolution of it. It's important. It is important. It's, it's, it's really cool to see this stuff. And a lot of it has been somewhat phased out, even though like now conventions are like half a dozen a weekend. And, you know, it's in some ways 
exploded. And they even talk about it here as it's less special now because there's so many of these. Boy, <laughs> look out, guys. What's coming down the pike is going to blow you away. Uh, character profile of Swamp Thing. How mad must a, a company like DC be if, if somebody else has all the rights to Swamp Thing except the comic, and that's the one who's able to generate some, some features, yeah, man, some got attention? That Adrian Barbeau flick out. You mentioned Tom, Tom Yates uh, earlier, or maybe a previous recording, but this is a piece of Tom Yates' Swamp Thing art. This was some of the early art that I had found. I got a digest. DC used to put out, like, I don't know, best of the year kind of digest that would collect maybe half a dozen stories. And I remember getting hold of one of those, who knows how, and the Tom Yates Swamp thing was in there. That's nice. And it's pretty haunting. He, he's, he's good in black and white. He builds his work for black and white. Oh, they were in color. Oh, is that true? Yeah, but this is beautiful in black and white. But I just remember this image and just being like, oh, yeah. You know, like one of the first ones that I just stared at and poured over and... Had no idea it wasn't, uh, you know, Bernie Wrightson. To me, it was the coolest looking thing I'd ever he's, seen. He's great, man. He's 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 strong right now. He's drawing the uh, Prince Valiant strips. Yeah, Mark Schultz, Scorchy Smith. So another thing the comic scene would do is they would look at comic strips and cartoonists. This and, is great, and it's Ron Goulart who, who's done yes. many many great books yep. about the uh, hi the history of comics. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. It's I've got several books of his on my shelf that are impressive. That I liked the book long before I realized. Oh yeah, this is the guy's name that's on several of these. So Jimmy, I mean, this is beautiful. It's Scorchy Smith. It's not, it's not Terry and the Pirates or Flash Gordon or so, you know some some big name thing. It's fucking Scorchy Smith, and we're gonna celebrate no sickles for a while, and then we're going to talk about Frank Robbins taking over, and you know the pain period in between. So this is a beautiful education that you're getting with top tier talents that are like lesser known. Yeah, and they give uh, Sickles credit for really inventing that style that Kniff kind of makes super popular of uh, black and white, you know, high contrast, almost realistic style. And Sickles is pretty clear about that. Like, he brought in this gray because he wanted to have that quality. He said everything was outlined or spotted blacks, and he wanted to have some uh, some in-between tones. Yeah, these guys would do these tricks. Like, they would look at the uh, at the comics page as a whole. And I remember reading, like, uh, the Dick Tracy strips. If you, in your minds, I think about it, the lettering is very, very big. And that was an effort to just, like, stick out amongst the comic page to be, like, sort of the most readable I like panels. That. I like that a lot. I never, I've never heard that before, and it makes total sense once you say it. Of course, um, Noel Sickles, the, the first artist that they they pull out here, is drawing Scorchy Smith when he's part of like the Associated Press, like the bullpen, because right. he's replacing somebody. He leaves after just a couple of years because you're not set up to make money there, right? And that's where I started to see this idea of like there's such a discrepancy between like I own the strip, yeah. Or I'm, I created it, I'm invested in it, versus like, hey, we're going to hire you to draw this. Same amount of work almost. Once exactly. it's up and running, and yet you're making $125 a week, and uh, you know, your buddy Kniff over here, look what he's pulling in. Right. Uh, one of the good examples for, for like that whole system, it's uh, that, that dude Dick Brown was doing drawn high in Lotus for uh, Mort Walker, who's the creator of it. And then Mort Walker does Beetle Bailey. Like he doesn't have time to be drawn two strips. So he got it through uh, the Johnstone and Cushing gig. But what that does afford you is that foot in the door with the syndicates. Mm -hmm. So then Dick Brown creates um, Hagar the Horrible. And that's the joint that he owns and leaves high in Lois and then goes and does the thing that he owns. This is where Sickles talks about, or where they talk about him leaving. He was making $125 a week, putting in 12 hours a day at the drawing board. If he had been, you know, I don't know what the exact name for it would be, but if, he, you know, if he had been like the creator or whatever, it's in 250 papers, should therefore be earning the news service something like $2,500 a week. And they're breaking off $125 for him out of that. So it's job or shit. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a huge difference than, say, creator of Terry and the Pirates and getting getting a nice big chunk of that $2,500 a week. It's I mean, it's a conversation that that uh, that we have routinely, man, uh, on and off the camera. You know, like, like if you own a com, if you own your comic and it's successful, like it could be $10,000 a page you've earned and, 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 and the yes. tap, the tap stays on. Uh, and when you're with Marvel DC, like they, they are so, they scrutinize it so deeply that like down to the penny of like the page that you drew, like, so like they won't even give you incentive off the book. Yeah. It's 
per page. And there's a formula in there, and it's always weak. Uh, Frank Robbins is the third guy that they that they look into, and um, all these guys are good. You know, it's it's funny. Scorchy Smith does not last long. They kind of outline you know the whole odyssey of Scorchy Smith because yeah. these guys come in and do you know a couple years or something, and overall, like people just don't keep up. Like they don't find the artist that can match the strip or to elevate the strip besides these couple of guys. And as they move on in their careers. Scorchy Smith quickly disappears. Sticks around because of the quality, I think probably of Noel Sickles. There's yeah. stories of when Toth starts drawing for DC, there's like reproductions of the Noel Sickles pages that right. uh, get passed around in the bullpen. Yeah, there are two volumes of Sickles' Scorchy Smith covering most of 3536, published by Nostalgia Press in 77, are, are still available. Nostalgia Press, I don't know how to sell this video, Jimmy, but Woody Gilman at Nostalgia Press is one of the most important people in fandom period because he worked at tops he created the motifs and aesthetics of sports trading cards the idea of putting stats on the back and designing it that way like that's that's his contribution he's the guy that paid wally wood to do the the um roughs and stuff for for mars attacks cards he's worked with people like wood all the ec guys down to spiegelman the nostalgia press uh volumes that that he's put out of flash gordon the Prince Valiant that you would have seen like in your in your library and the most instrumental piece that he ever put out is uh what they call the big book and it, it's the uh it's the first like EC horror um hardback collection that like all the OGs like it's the one that Klaus talks about in our shoot and review and and it's such a coveted thing because it it had all he had the eyes right like it's all this stuff like yes Master Race is in that one all the best Craig Steen is in that one. Uh, so, so like, I don't know how we do that episode because just nobody will watch it if we don't sell it right. But Woody Gilman is a name that people need to know. It's wild that uh, somebody of that influence doesn't, isn't known the way we know every, the people that we know. Right. And I mean, Stan Lee is an exception, but you know, like there's so many of these people that somehow they have been in front of the spotlight for comics history, for fandom, for whatever. And then you have other major influences that just seem to fall away. I think it's salesmanship, you know, yeah. like the ability to talk on the mic type stuff. But uh, I think one of the other big revelations here is uh, Frank Robbins been in the game a long, long, yes. long, long time. Man. Yeah, you guys at home may know him as like a Batman artist in the 70s and I guess into the 80s maybe. Yeah. Uh, you know, to give you some perspective, because this is in the 40s that we're talking about his work here. The third guy, Burt Christman, who's a name I don't know. And, he, but, and, he's, uh, he, and he's just a mid, mid Carter. I think he gets sick, I think is what happens. And, uh, but, oh no, you know what? But they he, also he admit went, that it sucks. He went, no, no, he's a standout. He's one of the three guys that he says are good. Um, he wanted to actually be a pilot and that's what he became a pilot and was shot down by the Japanese and was machine gunned on his way down like parachuting. So know your lane, like don't get hyped up on the subject matter of your comic and, and, and start beating on your chest. Just stick it to drawing board. It's after he leaves that things start to go downhill on uh, Scorchy Smith. Here's some of his pages. They're pretty good. Looking. Yeah, it does look good. Fantico, baby. Yeah, Fantico, there's still an iteration of them out there. This feels like a revelation. Are they the first publisher of Fred Hembeck comics? I don't know if that's where it first appeared, but they did collections of Hembeck. They were definitely like uh, doing Fred Hembeck comic books, like magazine right, right. sized books. So. Yeah, he was doing stuff in the fan press, no doubt. But I'm saying just like creating the one stop shop of Hembeck. And this is that era of like half a distributor. You, you know, like yeah. like they're doing they're publishing a few things, they have a store, but they're also almost distro. You know, like dude, centerfold piece in here. They're paying some money for that real estate, so right. you know they're selling some of this stuff. And it's funny to go through like prices because like books are starting to pop up more expensive items. You know, you suddenly have a specialty market. Um, I think that in the Marvel article they talk about that a little bit of the people that are going into those comic shops. Now we got an older, a little older group as opposed to the newsstand kids buying it. Which I don't know if that's ever been sorted out by publishers figuring out who they're selling what to. They did a series. Comic scene did a series creating the comics. Uh, part one is writing comics. This article, very boiler berserk. I could hardly make heads or tails. They're talking about different editorial preferences. Right. Like this editor likes characters. This editor likes, you know, just give them the plot. Writer editor conferences that may go as short as thirty minutes or go on for hours. Like it is so esoteric what they're talking about here. 
it is not at all like, listen, have a beginning, middle, and end. No. You know, have your characters change. Like, there's nothing like that. It is just like inside baseball of how they're literally selling a plot to uh, to Marvel or DC. And I, I, it's kind of weird. Yeah, I, I like seeing it in, in a reportage fucking, you know, regular folk magazine. But you're not gonna you're not gonna learn how to how to write comics with this. No, it's it, there's real no nuts and bolts on that part. But it is interesting to see like my style of writing is not geared for Marvel. I don't like doing the script after the artwork is done. So you do get a little bit of like reference to Marvel method. But again, like it's it's this is not writing 101. I'm not yeah. sure what this is. This is them figuring out how to talk about process and creation. Phil Suling, baby, Seagate distribution. Yeah, how about that? Like selling direct with some of the stuff, I guess, that they have big stock in. Yeah. He was an early investor in um, ElfQuest. Comics Journal ads. There you go. Still in Stamford, Connecticut, next to Vince McMahon's office. I was I was thinking about, like, designing this ad with, like, all the film that they have. Like, that, like this is a complicated ad to build. Yeah. To, to have the s- small stats of, like, all your stuff and glue it up, like... That's that's a complicated little piece to create, and they had all the materials. They they had the big cameras like behind the Fantagraphics building in their shed. They they that makes got sense. they got all the old uh, big computers and all that stuff. All right, so again, like we're taking a survey of comics all over. Let's look at around the world. In this case, Britain, and they're talking about like the different formats there of like weekly black and white comics, usually a couple of pages per feature. Um, Outline a few artists. Brian Boland's name comes up. I think Dave Gibbons is mentioned by name in here. Uh, John Bolton. This is Steve Dillon artwork being yeah. pulled out and shown off. Yeah, and they're, and they're they're talking about you know other comics. So like 2000 AD is, is like is like the hype, but then uh, there's you know Marvel UK and shit, and that's that's where this like John Bolton stuff is happening. Uh, this, I was talking with Glenn Dillon when we were in Germany once, and he's. He said that like so many of these dudes, including his brother Steve Dillon, got started in a Hulk UK magazine. That was the first place where where they really started to uh, to to show up. That's really wild to think that like there are these nexus moments where like a bunch of dudes just happen to be like same place, same time, and think of the creativity that comes out of that group. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I mean that that is like two two thousand AD and stuff. Uh, Alan Moore not mentioned, still a little early for that, which is which is fun. Yeah, it's interesting that he's not in here. The titles, I'll just read them off because there's just a couple. Victor, Warlord, Tracy, 2000 AD, Wizard, and Chips, Dandy, and Nutty. So a lot of books that I don't know at all, but it's kind of cool to have them, uh, ha- have them featured in here. We did a video on this right here. And and I swear to God, like we did this video, and then months later they put that book out again yeah. in a big treasury edition. I feel like we had uh, some influence on that. Hildebrandt Brothers. They're the I'm I'm always curious about those guys because I I don't understand the motto I don't know how, where they come from and even this they're already hype at this mm-hmm. point so it's like well where the fuck did you start like how how, how did your business work because like I just don't know but they're huge and they're persistent but I, you, there's not like you know one defining thing that set it off yeah I I'm with you. I knew them whenever they do like Marvel cards. Me I guess too. in the early '90s, sometime yeah. whenever the cards are all, all and they and they were spoken with hyperbole of like, oh yeah, the great Hildebrand brothers, we got a good get. And I'm like, okay, the one names. Now I know the name. Now let me like backwards engineer and try to figure out like, what, but it's not. It's just not clear. It's almost like a kayfabe thing that we could do, like uh, where you could just say you're the greatest or something like that. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm sure we'll get some comments filling this in. Like they have cited here in 1978, they held an exhibition at the Maryland Funny Book Festival. So, I don't know. I don't know when they start. You know, this might be another group that's been around for for decades before they come on my radar in the early 90s. Is that Jack Cats? Cats. I don't even know what that is. It's, like it's, it's, a, it's probably from uh, from First Kingdom somewhere. But they make a big mistake by not mentioning that anywhere. Right. Sell your books. All right, clearing clouds away. Heavy metal on the upswing with both movies release and a refocused outlook. We're about five years into heavy metal being published. Uh, pretty fun collage page here for your illustration. Graphics in this, it's it's interesting to see. Like, there's no real setup for the graphics in this. Like, the companies are not prepared to be like, here's our media kit with some good photos right. and some good illustrations to use. Like, you know, just collaging this together. But we've got new editors, including the publisher, has fired Ted White. And uh, is taken on that title himself, as well as 
He has, a, I don't know if she's an assistant editor, Julie Simmons Lynch, who is quoted a lot throughout this. So maybe she's the kind of working editor with uh, Mogul just being a little bit more hands-on. But it's basically talking about where heavy metal is these days and trying to have a little more stories and not just like, wow, art. They they say the thing that we all know and, 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 and sort of say, like, you can't read these comics. They're unreadable, and they're unreadable to the editors, they say, man. Uh, now, they do give a little bit of grace, and they're like, you know, this is European stuff, and it has to be translated. So may, maybe something is being lost in the translation. But almost everybody we talk to from, from that period, uh, go watch our Steve Bissett shoot interview and stuff, he was getting met, Metal Herlant uh, b- before it was it was being translated into English and stuff. And he was talking about like, oh, I couldn't wait to read that stuff. But then I was able to read that stuff. And not, it never sticks with you. Like it's it's uh, gobbledygook writing, but it does look so freaking cool. Man, that's another really good example, I think, of like the comics history of there's just not good writing. Right. You yeah. know, uh, spectacular yeah, it's a, it's to the look toughest at. Part. I mean, I, dude, I've been sit- sitting on... Um, us doing we we got a couple of volume we have two of the same volumes of Cordo Maltese. You never hear anybody say like this is the great Cordo Maltese story. It's like Hugo Pratt's art is dope. And like that's the video we're gonna have to do. It's just like Hugo Pratt, we don't even read the comic, just go through the art and point out the cool things that he does because uh I, I don't know that it's readable. They talk about again like a lot of these articles are very inside baseball. And what they cover. Yeah. Because they're talking about doing color separations and why working with these Europeans helps heavy metal because they provide the color separations. How expensive are these color separations? You know, that like that makes a difference in a glossy magazine. Circulation number is about 150,000. I think they printed a little bit more whenever the movie came out. By the way, the movie gets panned hard here whenever whenever it came out but very successful you know like at this point it's over 20 million which is a big figure at this time and talking about making a sequel which you know i guess we'll wait decades for it but interesting to see like the context of it was successful in its release but new york times and stuff are talking about how awful it is so i I knew the movie before i knew the magazine it was it was literally that kind of thing where you know you get you get a new car and then you see that car on the on the road kind of stuff Third grade, it was a like a midnight show on like Cinemax, but they were promoting it in between movies. And to see just like these badass characters doing adventures and stuff, I'm like, I gotta check out that that um that cartoon. And then like I stayed up late and I watched it, and there's titties and everything, and and there's like every color of female pubic hair. So she's got like a white bush. You'll see. Then there's like the Long Tomorrow type story where there's a ginger with a big red bush. And uh, I just, I'm like, what am I seeing? I'm like, if my parents wake up and have to pee (laughs) and they come through this room and they see me watching cartoons with big titty ladies and like a big dick fucking den and like, you know, all the weird shit going on with that. Like, I'm going to, I am not getting a TurboGrafx-16 for Christmas this year. (laughs) Your timeline's so funny to me because you're like five or six years younger. Like it just throws... The elements that are around, like, this should be, like, 1983, right. but it's really, like, 1980. It's 1990. 1991, yeah. It's 1990, <laughs> whenever whenever I, I discover it. But then after I saw it, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to the 7-Eleven, I'm going to the Rite Aid to, to get my comics, and so I recognize that logo, like, like on the racks, and, and, and it's a bad title for 1990, because I don't care about Black Sabbath and, like, Metallica. Right. So I never even fucked with that shit. But I'm like, hey, that has the same title. And I think there might even have been another magazine called Heavy Metal that was a heavy metal magazine or something. Like, yeah, it wouldn't be too surprising. So that was not a good title for a young boy in 1990 to like realize that there's magazine-style comics with, with, with titties in them and stuff. Well, I, I'll leave you with this uh, harsh critic from the New York Daily News. They gave the film no stars out of four and wrote, It's hard enough to make a movie out of a good book. Heavy metal is proof positive that's even stupider idea to try and make one out of a bad magazine. Yeah, go watch Animal House then, right? That's a nas- National Lampoon joint. All right, Sat- Super Saturday mornings. Uh, this is kind of like what's coming, what's what's on the schedule. Right, and the, the one thing that I think it is noteworthy is that Jeff Dare was probably working on Super Friends. Oh, man, that's interesting. They talk about, like, I think there have been iterations of this for like seven years. Like, it's one of the more successful of these long-running uh, Saturday morning cartoons. Um, I don't pull too much out of here except Thundar is coming up, 
and I think it's Steve Gerber that talks about like the regulations on violence and stuff. Like right. they can't even have Thundar throwing a punch. So, so on the uh, there, there's a great documentary about the Batman, like the Bruce Tim Batman doc, and they have to t- acknowledge the Super Friends and stuff first. And there's this one part where they talk about uh, the Batman and Robin. They get shrunken down, and they're fighting spiders. And on a, like the last season of Super Friends, they they put a a, a cup. On on a, on a spider, and from standards and practices, they got back that uh, a note that said that um, we have to know that the spider's okay. So so like they had to cut in a little piece where after they solve everything, that like it was just like a little where like uh, the spider is like yeah, w- walking away. So it, so TV was like that bad with like all the kind of censorship and all that kind of stuff, which is like you know GI Joe, it's guns and stuff, and that's why you have to create the bats. So that you, it's not people getting shot. It's it's robots. Also, by the way, uh, these miniatures that that's supposed to be Dracula, and it does look like Red F- Fox from Sanford and Son. Uh, you know what else? These things are like two and a half inches tall, and I was looking around for a ruler or something. I think these are bigger than the actual miniature. Yeah, figures. yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, because that would be the size of like those war miniatures and stuff. Th- what I love about this is it's like those Saturday morning um, ads that would be the center spread in like the comics of the time. Like yes. that's what all this is, and I don't know any of it. I've never seen any of this. Yeah, I feel like that stuff would come and go. You know, like it'd be like one, one year, season, two years, yeah. and and out. Uh, Loose Cruz, Howard Cruz would have a recurring column in the uh, in in the first maybe volume of comic scene. This one is him basically talking about coming up. Growing up in Alabama, wanting to be a cartoonist, talks about encountering the famous artist cartooning course, gets access to that thing. Takes like three years for him to work through there. Pretty cool. And then getting... We have that, by the way. Like, like uh, I remember, like, I borrowed it off of you. You got it off of uh, eBay, like loose mm-hmm. leaf papers. And then I borrowed it off of you and made my own, my own uh, Xeroxes. Is that not the... Alex Toth composition thing, or is that something else? I think the Toth composition is a different one. I think it's famous artists. What's because there's like at least two of those courses, right? So I think it might be from another one of the courses. But um, there are also like they were done in like these big bound volumes, right? And somebody sent one in. Like we have one volume of that between yeah. us. It was a three volume set, but amazing, amazing resource. And think about like generations of cartoonists went through that course or at least got hold of it and you know read it themselves and stuff like that was a really influential piece on uh the development of cartoonists because they did not have scrubs man and it was virgil parch and it was milk caniff and it was like al cap like uh, you know i can oh it's amazing it's It's, amazing it's 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 all the best i mean that's how i discovered who virgil parch was and and i love this piece right here i like we need to scan that and send that to uh caitlin mcgurk and the crew at the billy ireland cartoon art library because you always forget like you take it for granted. Billy Ireland is just what it's called. But like Billy Ireland is a dude that influenced fucking Milk Kniff. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, worth noting, like Howard Cruz, known for Stuck Rubber Baby. Yeah. Before that. This, this oh, is absolutely. before that. You know, so like this, earlier on in his career, before he makes the, the big piece that he's known for. Yeah. Pretty interesting to, to kind of like read it with that perspective. Yeah, but he was still getting bones, dude, with with uh, with his underground works. Yeah, definitely. A very tight cartoonist, too. Not a lot of examples. You can see a little bit here, but very uh, tight in his detail right. and stuff like that. When he's and doing black and white. Talks about meeting Kniff in New York, going to visit him, and what that experience is like and how different uh, maybe the reality of cartooning is versus what he dreamt of as a kid. Yeah. But but Kniff afforded him some opportunity, man. Like and and said like you get your chops up. Like I, because I think the lunch that he got with him was also with like the head of the syndicate yeah. or somebody that that you know if he was a player could have been like, hey Cruz, so we're gonna take your Wendell comic and push it put it in the newspaper. Yeah, hundred percent. Another strip article. Cy Barry, the artist of Phantom. Uh, for 20 years, talks about that. Dan Barry's brother didn't realize that. Me neither. I pulled out. Me neither. And and Dan Barry was uh, working on Flash Gordon at the time. So these guys were like, you know, the Manning brothers of of, of the Daily Strips. (laughs) That's amazing. Of the Adventure Strips. Yeah, the Adventure Strips. I always always think about that kind of stuff. Like when you have an internal pedigree and you're in some kind of field, like what was the home life like? Because clearly your parents did something to kind of school you in a way that that made you a little extra. And And I went to school with this dude he was younger than me, Luke Getze, and his dad was Coach Getze. And Luke Getze, I think he might still be working for um, Green Green Bay, the Packers. He he was a player. He played for Pitt. But, like, his pops, tough dude. And we only had to get fucking scolded by Coach Getze 
on Saturdays in the summer for a little intramural shit, that boy lived inside that and became a ruler, you know, like fucking millionaire behind that shit. So I think that like art parents or it, it could it be as simple as the brother being the inspirational figure, but art families or families like within a chosen medium or profession, I, I, I it's something I'm very interested and fascinated by. I didn't pull too much out of this. It's it's interesting to hear him talking about the state of adventure comic strips at this point. And in his mind, they'll come back. I don't know about that. Um, I think the artwork that they pull out looks all right. But also, like, how is this reproducing in a newspaper? Right. Especially whenever it's shrunk down to, like, how big are strips at this point about this big? And by the way, what what a what a fucking bitch of a strip to draw. Like he it's always a, and and one of the things they're talking about is like updating it for modern sensibilities. You know, this this strip like precedes Superman. You know, it's from the early 30s. I think it's from like 1931 or something. And uh the dark continent, uh Africa is spoken like the entire continent is the country. Um it talks about how the strip like hinges on the ignorance of the tribes around uh phantom and stuff so it's like he you know he's got to keep them ignorant and things uh so it's still going on it's it's the 80s i mean it was going on uh I, like I, I would get the tribune review just for the phantom and uh it's a di- it's a dicey strip like it's such a cool costume right and it's such a cool idea how about you just don't have it there like nobody cares that it doesn't have zebras in it anymore. You know, like, that's that's the thing that they got right with the um, Peter Chung uh, Phantom, where it's, like, cyberpunk Phantom. You just forget about all of that stuff. You don't need any of that. Just have them be a private eye or something. Looks really cool with the mask. It's almost just, like, eye outlines. Yeah, totally. And, and like, at this time, like, there was a cartoon. I forget what it was called. Maybe, like, Defenders of the Universe or something like that, where it's uh, Phantom, Mandrake the Magician... Flash Gordon and maybe like one or two other dudes, but I had the uh, I had the action figure and he had like a Ken doll head, the one like a head that you could squeeze, you know that like was a little, yeah, yeah. You know, a little balloon or whatever. But I know, so I had the figure without knowing what the what the guy was, and it was like going to some right wing aunt's house or something and seeing the newspaper and and like whoa, it's that same dude that I have a toy of. Uh, Paul Levitz, I think this is a, a guest, you know, it says guest spot. I think the different people will write in. This yeah. might be the part where John Byrne might have been the guest spot. Whenever right. he talked about being a cog in the machine. Right. In this case, it's Levitz talking about comics fandom. Again, something that goes back to the editorial of this magazine. Good issue in that it all it all certainly fits what what's laid out there in the very beginning. But it's a cool article because he talks about where comics are here in 1981 versus like, where we dreamt they could be in the 60s. And I I have this kind of thought exercise a lot because of people like Bill Boyshell from Copacetic or Gary Groth from Comics Journal, where like they were talking about the quality of comics as an art form way before they it was sort totally. of widely accepted. And then like when I talk to them now and it's like, hey man, they're in every library, schools are taught, there's, you know, hundreds of these books coming out a week. Did you ever see this? And it was like, no, none of them. You know, like when when you were dreaming of having comics more widely accepted and better quality, it's way beyond whatever they dreamt. And that's what Levitz is laying out here in 1981, way beyond what all these fans were dreaming of in the 60s. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, the the, the title of the uh, Fantagraphics oral history is called We Told You So. Yeah, and look, it's almost the same thing that he's parroting here. We won, and we won a victory beyond our wildest dreams. Paul Levitz is the perfect guy to uh, to say that and to write this piece because he is like he's the wonder kid, you know. Like he is, you know, maybe he's twenty three or so here because he started at DC at like age twenty one and uh, published his own stuff for a while. Extremely literate, probably one of the smartest people in terms of book learning. Uh, might might have gone to Ivy League college. Yeah, it's 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 kind of cool. I like this article for that reason. Just kind of like again, everybody at home, whenever you're feeling unhappy about comics, step back and look at where they're at, and yeah. then see what you can affect if there's something that you don't really like. But chances are, maybe just pivot and look at something else in comics because like it's pretty damn rich right now. Totally, and you know we've been into in the game for 20 years at this point. A little more for you probably. Uh, so we've seen trends and we've seen developments and things like like social media coming to the fore there was a time when we were like man i would never get a myspace right 
right? And now we got a fucking daily YouTube channel and it's it's paid way beyond dividends, you know? Like it's it's this extremely valuable thing. So you have to keep this open mind and you have to, you know, it's forest for the trees. Like you have to be able to assess like the, the changes that are coming and how you can exploit them for your purposes. Fred Hembeck, for yeah. anybody at home that's unfamiliar, he would do a lot of this stuff in all kinds of places, Marvel Age magazine, things like that. So you see his, his uh, distinct style. I think maybe inking with a brush here, something I don't think about with Fred Hembeck. Right. He's not in his mature phase yet. And then like old magazines, you end up seeing uh, articles continue at the back and preview for the next issue on sale January 12th, 1982. So that kind of answers that question. Right. Super cool, man. It's a long time coming. And, and uh, you know, there are these series, Comics Interview, Amazing Heroes, Comic Scene, Comics Journal. Uh, these are the magazines I'm far more interested in exploring than, you know, the post, post-bust 90s wizard magazines. Uh, it's a different conversation that gets to happen. It's a lot of different names that uh, get to be talked about. You know, I think in that same issue of uh, issue two, now it might be issue three of Comic Scene where there's like a whole Don Bluth feature. He, you know, he just left Disney and is going to make Rats of Nim. Like, it's not comics exactly, but it, but it's it's a it's a great thing to talk about and uh, in in terms of you know where art jobs were at the time and stuff. You can really see the evolution too of how comics are covered. Yeah, you know, it's like they're not on their own island yet you know it's like we're going to get out of the sci-fi conventions but we're still going to keep the animation we're going to keep some of this stuff that has some similarity and uh and that's kind of where comic scene was i think throughout its publication was uh taking a wide survey of comics but also kind of selling you know like a little bit different than a comics journal for example right good to go jimmy yes okay favors like follow subscribe to the youtube channel hit the bell so that we can let you know what new videos are uh, available. We are a daily YouTube channel with more than 1,500 videos in our filmography, and there's a good chance we talked about some of your favorite comics. I encourage you to hit the magnifying glass on the front page of the Kayfabe YouTube channel, search for your favorite titles, and uh, check out those episodes. If, by chance, we did not talk about your favorite comics on the channel yet, you have to let us know. Do, the, do so in the comments. Let us know what those comics are, and we will push those comics a little bit higher on our to-read pile. Jimmy and I are going to be at Big Apple Comic Con uh, come December 16th. It's been years since we've been to the Big Apple, and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys. So, so please come through and bring your comics that we have yet to sign. We have a Patreon, and on the Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon... Uh, the King Kayfabers get all the videos before anybody else, and uh, w when the internet cooperates, they are hanging out with us in a live stream recording session as we uh, make these episodes, mitigates the Kayfabe effect. They, they, get, they have access to the comics that we talk about before anybody else uh, can scoop them up on the aftermarket. Ultimately, the videos are brought to you by the books that we make, and Before You is a pretty good sample of our bibliography, but we'll get into the nitty-gritty. Jimmy, let the people know what you got coming out soon. My next release is Street Angel, Princess of Poverty from Image Comics. This will be out in late November, in time for the holiday gift for the uh, action comic, superhero comic lover in your life. And Street Angel, Princess of Poverty collects all the Street Angel comics that are not in Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, also available from Image. And, uh... Get both books. It'll complete your collection. I have been self-publishing lately. True Crime Funnies number one is available on jimrug.com, along with BW and 1986 zine. And if they are sold out there, you can still read them on patreon.com slash jimrug. And my contribution to the grand design history is The Hulk, which is available in limited quantities because it is sold out at the uh, distribution level. So if you haven't added Hulk grand design to your collection yet, you need to pick that up next time you hit the comic shop. Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is my big one for 2023, and uh, it is going fast. Man, there's more than uh, probably 75% of this print run is gone, and stores have been re-upping. It was the number one reordered book on, on Comicron, uh, so thank you guys so much. Thanks to the stores for uh, for supporting the book, but if you even have any thought that, you're, that you want this or you want to get it as a gift, make sure you scoop it up uh, right away. Uh, it's the best book I've made to date, 500 plus pages. 10-year anniversary of Hip Hop Family Tree, 50th anniversary of the culture. Scoop it up. Uh, not the last holiday release I'm going to have. Uh, coming November 14th is the X-Men Grand Design trade paperback, collecting all of my X-Men Grand Design works. Uh, a couple volumes of the, that is out of print uh, as we speak, so make sure uh, if you are missing out 
on your uh, X-Men Grand Design. Scoop that up, you'll get it all in one. And there is a trilogy of horror comics that I have made under the Red Room umbrella, Anti-Social Network, Trigger Warnings, and coming in January is this trade paperback right here called Crypto Killers, which uh, collects my 2023 season of Red Room comics with a bunch of extras, uh, probably nearly 100 pages of, of extras in, uh, in, 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 in that run, in that book. The books are the most important part of keeping cartoonist kayfabe solvent and uh, functional. But there are some other ways to support the channel. Jimmy, let the people know. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, mugs, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. All good ways to support the channel. Give them those final merchandise, Jimmy, and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.